Our message text comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, beginning with verse 15. So let us listen again for God's message to us. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? And they answered, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him, and they went away. These are the words of Scripture. Thanks be to God. It is common in some cultures for patriots to name their children after their national heroes. For example, when I was in Croatia, which the people there call Hrvatska, the name Hrvoje literally means Croat, and there were many boys named Hrvoje. It's a patriotic name. Well, in the first century in Palestine, a mother's were naming their sons after the heroes of the Maccabean Revolution a century and a half earlier. Familiar names show up in the Gospels. For example, names like Judas, which we think of as a bad guy's name, but it's just the Greek way of rendering the word Judah, which was their nation's name. Very patriotic. And the name, likewise, of Matthew and John and Simon, these were all heroes of the Maccabean Wars of Independence. And so the mothers who were naming their children after their heroes were probably hoping that some of those boys would grow up to become the modern heroes that would help rescue them this time from Rome. Indeed, the Jewish people kept trying to free themselves. There was a moment just before Jesus was born, 4 BC, when the time seemed ripe for revolution. Why? Herod the Great died. Revolution broke out all across Judea. The leader of the revolt up in Galilee was a man named after his country, Judas. He's known to history as Judas the Galilean. He's not one of the 12 disciples. He was, this is back in 4 BC. Apparently, Judas was a popular name, uh, since, of course, it was the name of the nation, and it was a hero's name. But anyway, Judah, known as Judas the Galilean, led a revolt, and he rallied people to revolution. And he focused on a single tool that was the greatest tool of Roman oppression, and that was the tribute tax that they were all required to pay to Rome. The tribute tax that Rome levied against its conquered people was used throughout their empire. And it symbolized, for everybody who was conquered, Roman authority. And for that reason, of course, it was deeply resented. Why? Well, the tribute tax paid for those Roman soldiers and their armaments, their weapons, their palaces, their banquets. It paid for the Roman army standards that they had placed with the golden eagles, even within the precincts of the temple itself, which scandalized Jewish people. So in 4 BC, Judas the Galilean ordered his people not to register to pay the tax. It was a tax revolt. 
He and his people went so far as to burn down houses and steal the cattle of people who did pay the tax. They were considered collaborators. That's what we learned from the ancient Jewish historian Josephus. Well, you can predict the response. The Roman army comes down en masse, killing tens of thousands of people. The New Testament scholar John Dominic Crossan said that the memory of that crushing defeat would have been the subject of endless conversations among the people as they gathered for supper in that time. Like Mary and Joseph sitting around the table. Remember the day the Romans came? Yeah. Because the wound was still fresh. It was less than a generation old. Everybody knew somebody who died. Everybody who had family members who were killed. Everybody had a story of how they escaped But everyone was again paying the tribute tax. Now that tax had to be paid in Roman coinage. The silver denarius coin that they had to pay the tax with had an image of the emperor Caesar and a title around the perimeter. It said in abbreviated Latin, Divi Filius, son of of God. How could Caesar be the son of God? Well, the god Apollo, according to their legend, had impregnated Caesar's grandmother, making his father a god, so Caesar was the son of a god. So the tribute tax and that coin are the subject of the text that we read from Matthew's gospel. They are behind the trick question that they brought to Jesus to get him to incriminate himself because they figured they had him because no matter which way he answers their question, they got him. If Jesus advocates paying the tax, sure, you have to pay your taxes. It's the law. Well, he's going to lose support because nobody wants their hero to tell them to pay the tax. His support will dry up. But if he advocates not paying the tax... Well, he could be arrested right then as a traitor and possibly executed like Judas the Galilean was 30 years before. So who were these people that were trying to trip up Jesus in this way? Matthew tells us that they're a very unlikely coalition. The Pharisees, or perhaps we should call the Pharisees the Puritans, because that was their agenda, a hyper-focus on purity laws in the Bible. They made common cause with the Herodians, Who are they? Well, we don't know too much about them, but their name says it all. They were representing the interests of King Herod, one of the four sons of Herod the Great, who died in 4 BC, whose lavish palace and lifestyle was supported by additional local taxes. Now, normally, Pharisees were totally opposed to King Herod and his godless ways, but As they say, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, at least for a moment. So the line that Jesus uses to cleverly shut them down is, historical Jesus scholars say, absolutely authentic. The same line shows up in all three Gospels and the Gospel of Thomas. Jesus said this, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. Now Jesus was not about to lead a tax revolt against Rome, but neither was he advocating passivity. Jesus' tactics are intentional and subtle. You know, Richard Rohr, Franciscan scholar and author, has written that um, some people, like social activist kinds of people, are sometimes disappointed by the fact that um, besides Jesus' action that one day to shut down the temple, he didn't directly do a lot of open confrontation with the oppressive structures of his day. What was Jesus' main strategy? Rohr says this, Mainly, it was a refusal to participate in almost all external power structures or domination systems. 
So how did Jesus conduct that strategy of non-participation? Rohr says his primary action is a very simple lifestyle, which kept him from being co-opted by those very structures. Jesus never said that that was the only legitimate strategy, but that one time that he participated in a direct confrontation with Rome, he did pay for it with his life. You remember, one week after that donkey ride into Jerusalem, in mockery of Pilate's procession into the city, one week after he drove out those money changers and shut the place down, he was arrested, convicted, and executed. So we can see that Jesus' opposition under Roman oppression included very few limited options. He could quietly refuse to participate in the power structures, and as long as he did that, he was safe. As soon as he confronted them directly, he was killed. Well, we live in different times in nearly every way. In fact, our participation in the systems of government here are assumed as necessary by our system itself. We can vote. We can lobby. We can write to our leaders and express our views. We can even peacefully protest, even by the thousands like we did back in the days of the George Floyd protests. And if we're able, we can even perform oppositional comedy routines or set up partisan cable news networks. That's what we do in our day and time. So the question is this. What should guide our politics? What outcomes should we advocate for? Here, I believe Jesus' answer is very clear and important. What could it mean for us to give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's? Well, let's look at those two separately. What are the things that are the emperor's? In other words, what can the government require of us legitimately? I believe that that is an important question that every Christian has to struggle with individually. I also believe that no one has the right to tell you what to do. And that's very Presbyterian. We in our Presbyterians system have a book of order which tells us that God alone is Lord of the conscience. So no matter what anybody says, you have to wrestle with your conscience. We are individually responsible for using the discernment and wisdom that we have been given to try to make wise decisions. So for me, the guidance that I look to most is Jesus. Even if I do that inadequately, I do that as sincerely as possible. Early Christian writers advise, uh, advised early Christians, like Paul and Peter, for example, to keep their heads down, obey the laws of the land, and just try to get along with the political, political system that they were living in. However, the early church concluded that there were limits the state could go too far and demand too much. And when it did, as when the state required the veneration of the worship of Caesar, the early Christians said no. We would call their refusal to comply civil, civil disobedience. They called it bearing witness. And some were martyred for it. You know, the Greek word martyr means witness. Throughout history, Christians in various situations have concluded that obeying the laws of the land was sometimes incompatible with their Christian faith. And so they have resisted. Some broke the laws of the fascists in order to protect life. 
Some broke the laws of the communists in order to continue to worship God. As the New Testament puts it, our ultimate citizenship is in the kingdom of God, in which God, and not any Caesar, is the final authority. So what does it mean, then, to give to God the things that are God's? Well, the question is, what belongs to God? And every faithful Jewish person would immediately have the answer. In the words of the 24th Psalm, which Pastor Kim read, the earth is the Lord's and all the, that dwell in it. Now, we call ourselves, as the church, the beloved community because we believe that we've been created by God and loved by God and named and claimed by God. As Paul says, we are the Lord's. As the 100th Psalm says, we are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. So what does it mean then to give to God the things that are God's? If not everything. I believe that's what the word surrender means. Surrender is the act of faith that says, I have to trust that I am in God's hands. It's the non-anxious conclusion I can reach when I say I believe that being still or cease striving is when I know that God is God. So I can let go of my ego defenses, my resentments, my selfishness, and try to grow out of self-centeredness. I can grow in being mindfully present in each moment, I can grow in God consciousness. In short, I hope to grow in love as I give to God the things that are God's. And I believe, like Richard Rohr, that that kind of surrender leads to action, to public action on behalf of the values that motivated Jesus' ministry. So I believe that that kind of surrender leads to a heightened sensitivity to the people that Jesus called the least of these, the poor and the marginalized. I believe it should create greater compassion, especially for vulnerable people. I believe it will include getting involved in opportunities to serve where they're available. For me, and I hope for all of us, it includes political action on behalf of people who were at the heart of Jesus' concern. So in our system, in which participation is assumed, I believe we're responsible for being involved. Now, that leaves a lot of questions unanswered, and I get that. What is the role of government? Well, people have different opinions about that. What view should we have of the Constitution? Well, people differ about that. Each one of us has to come to the conclusion that is the best we can do. People of God differ. That's to be expected. But our commitment as Christians is to do all that we can do to give to the emperor only the things that are the emperor's and to God all of the things that are God's. Amen.